Scientists are usually the ones doing the testing, but this time they are the ones being tested. And about time too, a new report by world-renowned statistician William M. Briggs, who we've had on Outsiders, by the way, is putting scientists and scientific institutions under the microscope to see just how reliable they are. And the results are quite Shocking. Joining us to discuss this is a great friend of this show, marine physicist Peter Ridd. Peter, always great to see you. Uh, you've always been saying that maybe scientists should spend more time studying the scientific community and its particular flaws. Well, somebody has done that. Talk us through it, Peter. What, how important is this uh, study and what are the key findings that uh, you alerted us to? Well, as you mentioned, normally scientists do experiments on things like mice, but in this case, uh, scientists became the mice and they became uh, a, a sci another scientist did an experiment on a thousand other scientists. By giving them a whole bunch of data, it happened to be on whether immigration affects community attitudes and government responses. It doesn't actually matter. And it got a thousand scientists to then work out whether the answer was yes, there was an effect, or no, there was not an effect, or whether you, you just couldn't tell from the data. And the results were amazing. About a quarter of the scientists said no, no effect. A quarter of the scientists said yes, there was definitely an effect. And half the scientists said yes, there was an effect, but it wasn't statistically significant, which really means that they just, you can't tell. So what this means is that there should be one answer, either yes, no, or can't tell, but the answers were all over the place. It means that essentially between half and three quarters of the scientists got it wrong. And that amazingly is pretty typical of the uh, what we see in peer-reviewed work, that when it's checked, about half of it, very roughly, is wrong. So it's yet another example of how our scientific institutes are just completely failing us and the scientific profession has become one of the least trustworthy, I hate to say it as a scientist, one of the least trustworthy that there is. Rita. Well, we saw that throughout COVID mm. with the uh, modelling, even locally, that was just so dramatically wrong from the Burnett Institute and the Doherty Institute. And uh, that's really reduced trust in, in medicine, in scientists, in public health, because we saw it in real time. We saw these catastrophic uh, models that were nowhere close to reality and the insane advice like masking outdoors or closing schools, all those sort of things. So how can we restore trust back into the scientific community? Because that's important. Well, the first thing that needs to be done is the scientific institutions have to accept that they have a real problem. Mm. Now, privately, they will they agree. There is this thing called the reputation crisis. They know half of the peer-reviewed literature is wrong. But then they say, oh, you've got to trust scientists. And you think, well, you're not actually accepting that there's a problem. They haven't accepted all the stuff that was wrong about COVID. I'm sure there was a whole heap that was right, but a lot of the stuff about vaccination was clearly wrong about whether it stopped transmission. They haven't admitted it. Nobody's having a major inquiry in virtually any other country except Sweden, where, of course, they didn't lock down in a major way. So the only way, they, they've got to start to admit they have a problem and uh, do something about the peer-reviewed system because at the moment the wheels are falling off trust the scientists and there's a very good reason for that. They are untrustworthy as an institution. James. And Peter, I mean, how much of this comes down to the fact that You've got scientific truth, which you're out there groping for, and then there's a narrative which you have to hew to to get funding to continue to pursue your scientific mm -hmm. uh, cases and research. And is this why it seems like, with the exception of perhaps some areas of tech, really disruptive science and true scientific discoveries seem to have kind of stalled in recent decades? Well, you, you're dead right. It has stalled. In fact, it's, um, there's been many observations. So, for example, in physics, the last really big, really big discovery that's changed our life was probably the discovery of the laser, to actually make a laser, or DNA back in the 1950s. Now, there's been technological developments on that. In terms of really big discoveries, um, it's almost stopped, uh, mm. which is a bit perplexing. Maybe... It's because we've discovered all the big things, but maybe there is a fundamental problem with the way we do science. The funding imperative that you mentioned is certainly one of the problems, but that doesn't explain the problems with COVID. That was a, almost an ideological problem that people were not allowed to dissent. 
Uh, so I think there's a lack of dissent in science. There is the funding imperative. There's so many problems that we need to get to the bottom of because at the moment science is failing us. Uh, Peter, I just want to quote um, from this study. Richard Smith, a former editor of the British Medical Journal uh, in 2015, said that uh, if peer review was a drug, it would never get on the market because we have lots of evidence of its adverse effects and don't have evidence of its benefit. It's time to slaughter the sacred cow. So that was Richard Smith of the BMJ in 2015 saying peer review doesn't work, but we're still addicted to it, aren't we? Yeah, and the worst thing is that you often hear these scientists talk about peer review as the gold standard, and, mm. and yet everybody knows that peer review is a complete joke. And I've, I've mentioned this on the show a lot that you know the if we don't solve this problem of, of the main quality assurance system we have in science, peer review, which we know is a complete disaster, there's no p possibility that we can solve the problem. And the way to solve the problem is introduce dissent back. Why doesn't the Australian Research Council have 10% of its budget to do major reviews of supposedly important science, which could well be wrong? We know in America, for instance, that they, they waste about $30 billion a year chasing after research that proved to be wrong. So the science discovers something, a whole lot of money goes to follow that, but it turns out five years later the original work was wrong. So we just it's a disaster. The whole scientific system is turned into a disaster. Well, thankfully, thankfully, there are people like you there, Peter Ridd, uh, who are keeping an eye on all this for the rest of us. Thanks so much. Always great to chat to you. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Peter Ridd there. <laughs>